everybody. Uh, we're so excited that you were able to make it out to our webinar. Um, so welcome to the paperless learning webinar where this week we'll be talking about um, classroom management and different tricks on how you can manage your classroom and your students in this new remote learning setting. So before we get into it, we're going to introduce ourselves. My name is Janan. Um, I am a current paper employee. I teach online in the mornings. It's more one-on-one, -on -one, um, but I've been teaching online for uh, many years. I also used to be a classroom teacher as well. Um, and I used to be a tutor for paper before I became a headquarter employee. So I'm very, I, I know a lot about what it is like to teach, to teach remotely and on how to learn remotely as well. So I'm really excited to be here um, with you all today to show you a little bit about what we do. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa. I am also a paper employee. Before I joined the paper team, I was a classroom teacher for six years. I have not taught online, so I will bring the perspective of going from the physical classroom to the online classroom um, and kind of, you know, familiarize ourselves with that. Great. So as we go along as well, we'd love to hear about uh, where you're from. So feel free to use the chat. And also we do have a Q&A function. Um, I just wanted to clarify that if you had any um, live comments or questions to please use the chat in that case, the Q&A will be from uh, for the end of the webinar. So if you have any specific questions that you want us to address by the end, you can answer there. That'd be really cool. So we have a few people starting to answer. We have uh, some from all over the, the, the world. So that's really interesting to see. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so this is a picture that uh, the, a teacher posted on a teacher group on Facebook of something that happened. I did change the name from another name to Thomas. So uh, this is a teacher who is using Zoom to give their class and Unfortunately, uh, the teacher tried to ask their student to turn on their camera and microphone and Thomas just answered, nope. So uh, I'm sure this looks familiar to a lot of you for those who might have tried some uh, live lessons online. Um, and maybe you're dealing with some other issues as well. We know some teachers are dealing with being turned into memes right now. Um, some teachers are being talked over. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different issues that come into place when we change from a physical setting to a virtual one. So once again, as we go along, um, please feel free to let us know what kinds of issues you're dealing with or what kinds of issues you're afraid that are going to come up in this new setting. And uh, we'll do our best to address those and help you out with, uh, with those particular issues. So as Janan briefly mentioned, one of the things that we will run into is difficult students. But the good news is setting our classroom expectations will not be all that different from what we do in the actual physical classroom. As we have experienced in the physical class classroom, one of the most important things to do is to set our ex expectations with our students right from the get go and as soon as we possibly can. It's going to be very important that we have that first communication with them. And because it is a little bit different from our physical classroom, you know, the expectations might vary a little bit, but it's always a good reminder, even if they are the same, to just go over the expectations and let the students know what's going on. It's also very important that the students understand what's expected of them in order for them to be as successful as they possibly can be. They'll, there will be less room for any types of arguments or miscommunications that might happen if we are very clear right from the get-go. It'll also make our lives a lot easier in terms of making sure that we provide that positive reinforcement for behaviors when they are following the expectations and the guidelines that we've put out. So in terms of how this can look for your online classroom, one of the ways that you can set expectations is come up with a an online classroom contract in a way. It's something that I've done in my physical classroom uh, as one of the very first activities. We all sit down and brainstorm together what we would expect of ourselves and what we would expect of others in the shared space. We write it out and then we all kind of sign it. And then sometimes when you need a little bit of a reminder, you can take some homeroom time um, depending what platform you're using for online, if you're able to use Zoom and sit down, you can still have that home room. Sometimes it might be sending out an email of just a reminder of, hey, we built these expectations together, we built this contract together, let's keep that in mind so that we can have the best possible space for our communication. Also, um, I've noticed that we've had a few more people join us since we've started. So I'm just going to reiterate to uh, if you want to let us know where you're from, that would be great. Otherwise, as we go on, uh, please let us know the types of issues that you're currently dealing with as a teacher in a virtual setting and uh, 
and or which kind of issues you're afraid to be dealing with moving forward. So we'll try our best to address those as we go on. So it's also really important to know your platform. Uh, this is probably one of the most important things in uh, managing your classroom. So we know that um, the, this is going to be a completely new setting. You're probably using platforms that you're not used to using. So it's really important to know what they offer. So we will talk a little bit about Zoom since this is something that we are familiar with and we know that a lot of teachers are opting for using Zoom in a live classroom. So um, just Zoom in itself, you're able to block the microphone if you are the, the host, so you can stop the microphone so that students will not be talking over you unless um, you want them to answer any questions that you have. There's also the raise your hand feature. So if you stop the microphone, but they have a question, they can use the raise your hand feature or talk in the chat. And we would really suggest to practice first. So practice with your friends, practice with your loved ones, get them on a Zoom meeting with you so you can really uh, learn to navigate it. And that way, when you come into your classroom, you're going to be confident right away. So that will already break down a big barrier since we know that being confident with your students is huge in, um, in getting them to, to pay attention to you and listen to you and uh, be successful in the classroom. So if you have the confidence and you know how to navigate your platform properly, that is going to stop a lot of issues from happening in itself. It's also really important to, uh, to set the date. So what we mean by that is to reinforce due dates and assignment expectations. So this kind of goes a little bit with what we said before in setting your expectations. So this is going to be very important um, so that the students know exactly what is expected from them and exactly when they should be uh, should be giving which assignment back to you. So uh, make sure there's a very clear schedule of what work needs to be done and by when. And this could also mean even if you have an assignment for your students, you can guide them to the point of writing out how much time you think that this should take them to do. So this will help them know exactly what they will need, um, if they need any extra help and anything, and this will really help them know what, what's expected of them. And so this is just really to help your students. So it's better not to surprise them. It'll help them stay organized. It will help your classroom stay organized and uh, successful for everybody involved. One of the large parts of classroom management, especially online, but just in general, is fostering autonomy for our students. As we mentioned in our web webinar last week, the theme was how to lesson plan for online. We discussed a lot about how it's gonna have to be very independent work and fostering autonomy is going to allow the students to be successful in their independent work. I know for myself, um, if something is handed down to me and I'm told do it exactly this way and I'm not the one who came, necessarily came up with the idea or created the skeleton, I'm not gonna perform quite as well versus on the one that I came up with that idea and I had the autonomy to really take it over and make it mine. So getting the students to take ownership of their own learning and to also monitor their progress is gonna be huge. One of the best ways that you can make sure they, they do this is to set the example yourself. Be transparent with your students. Let them know this is a new space for everyone and that we're gonna be discovering this together, but here's a great way of how we can discover it together and how we can be autonomous in this. Um, the things that you can do are provide organizational charts uh, that can help the students keep track of their to-do list each day. We have heard from many teachers that, um, and from many parents as well, that some of these students are getting multiple packages for each day's lessons from sometimes up to seven different teachers. So they have, it, they have a hard time keeping track of everything that they need to do, especially when they're not in the typical physical space where it you know, kind of turns their brain on that, oh, it's time for me to focus and, and learn and work on my education. Also provide high interest activities. Get feedback from the students about what they wanna work on. If they feel like their ideas are being incorporated into the units and the lessons and the themes, they're gonna be much more motivated to actually work on that and work independently and happily on that. So make sure that you get that feedback from your students. A huge thing as well is going to be pick your battles. Unfortunately, we will not win them all and we will exhaust ourselves if we try to win all of the battles. And some of them are just not worth fighting, especially when we're in such a new space and we're putting so much energy into adapting our lessons and figuring out what's going on. So sometimes one of the greatest things we can do is to just learn to let things go and set our own limits and know what's okay with us and what's not okay with us and then just remain consistent on that. 
Great. Uh, so as we know, virtual learning is very different from physical learning and uh, students will be learning on their own terms. So what this means is simply that they're going to be taking the learning into their own hands. And we spoke a little bit before about how it's very important that students need to be independent in this setting. So one of the ways you can foster this new um, autonomous environment is to establish clear lines of communication. So um, if you're, how you're going to be group messaging uh, out to your students is going to be very important. So we would just say once again of being consistent. Um, so just pick one and stick to it. So whether that's using email or a classroom page where students can pose questions and ask, uh, and you can answer some questions. If there are going to be class announcements um, or if it's rather a physical schedule that's going to be sent home. Uh, I saw that we did get a question. We'll respond to that as soon as we're done with the with the clear communication aspect. Um, and as well, so, sorry. So extra, it's really important as well that you, uh, you let us, you let your students know if you're going to be making any changes to your lesson plan. So you can use this, uh, this means of communication to be, to be using it for this as well. And it's really important to let your students know why you're changing it um, so that the students can find meaning into uh, the new plan that they're going to be doing. So you can give them a new, a new uh, unit or lesson plan for, uh, for the new, for whatever you have changed and um, establish and maintain a course pattern. So what this means is including schedules for group activities. So if your platform, of course, allows you to hold them. Um, if not, schedules for things like online quizzes and assessments, uh, as we've mentioned before, timeframes for assignments, and when you would introduce new lessons and new plans. So we have a question here. Uh, Lisa, did you wanna add anything? Sure. So the question is, can we provide some examples on picking your own battles? We definitely can. Uh, we'll mention one of the examples later on in terms of how students communicate with you versus video chat or microphone. So I won't go into that example too, too much. But one of them would be for the organizational charts. I know myself, I used to always give specific organizational charts, but maybe that's not the chart that's for the student. So instead of getting into a really big battle power struggle, you can just say, you know what? You go online, you go look for one, show it to me, and then we'll work on it from there. Um, some other ones have also been, you know, I can think of more of a fit in the physical classroom, but if you're comfortable with them chewing gum or not, is it going to distract you? So just things that might distract you on the online, on, in the online setting will be important to keep in mind and if you're actually going to be okay with that. So for some people, it's going to be, um, you know, if they mute the microphones so that the students can't use the microphones or if they turn off the videos so the students can't use that or having different functions, it's all going to kind of depend on the platform you have. Uh, if you folks actually don't mind, it would be great to hear from you if you know what platforms that your districts are having you use. That would be super helpful and we can kind of gear it a little bit more towards that. So uh, let us know if that answered your question. Like Lisa mentioned, we will be getting a, a bit more into what that looks like. Um, so for another thing that will be important for your students is to provide choice. Now I know I said to pick a means of communication and stick to it. Um, that being said, it, it, it comes back to uh, students taking their learning into their own hands and being autonomous in how they choose to learn. So uh, I said choice of communication here. This is really more specific to live class, um, live classes. So if we take the example that we saw at the beginning with Thomas, who did not want to turn on his mic or um, his video for the teacher. So in this case, we don't know why Thomas doesn't want to turn on his mic or video. Maybe he's embarrassed of where he lives. Maybe there's a lot of distractions going on around him and he doesn't want to turn his microphone on. It is possible as well that the student just wants to mess around and be difficult, that there is always that possibility, as we know as teachers, um, there are some of those students who do that, but we have to give the benefit of the doubt in this situation. Um, this is an example of picking your own battle. So we really think that as long as the student is communicating, if they're doing it by chat, then you can allow them to make that choice. Of course, it's okay to tell them we would prefer, we think it's better that you turn on your microphone and video for us for this lesson. We think you'll get more out of it. However, you do have the choice to do so. And if the student does not choose to, uh, to do none of those things, so let's say the name of your student pops up. So Thomas's name is there, but he doesn't wanna send any messages through chat. He doesn't wanna turn on his microphone or his video. 
what do you do? So you do exactly what you would do as um, in a physical class if your student was not there. You can't force your students to participate. Um, and like we said, this is a lot, really a lot of this is based on student autonomy. So if the student decides not to participate, you do the same things as they would um, if, if they didn't come up to class. So just quickly to go back before we move on in terms of giving examples of pick your own battles, during our lesson planning webinar, one of the things that we greatly suggested for, for lessons and for creating assessments for teachers is you can provide um, assignments where the students have to record themselves, maybe teaching their own math lessons so that you can assess them on that concept and see how well they understand that. But you might have some students who are not comfortable recording themselves and then sharing that on a platform like Google Classroom for their classmates and their peers to see. That's where you can kind of think to yourself, well, do I need to stand firm and set a limit that it has to be a video or maybe I can allow them to write up an explanation or a script and kind of adapt it for them so that it's done in a way that's more comfortable for themselves as well. So to move on, we want to talk a little bit about the difference between classroom management and classroom discipline. If you folks want to take a second to write what you think the difference might be as we go through it, that would be great, but don't feel like you have to. So classroom management is all about how you are setting up your classroom, what you are doing ahead of time to avoid potential behaviors and potential issues in the actual classroom. So classroom management is very much so focused on teacher instruction and the format that you have set up. So it's going to be important to make sure that you have a plan in place, again, for setting your expectations and being clear on that. And that will hopefully help you to avoid any discipline issues and having to really dis use discipline. In an ideal world, none of us would have to, and it would just be perfect management all the time. But unfortunately, that is not always the case. So classroom discipline now is in reaction to a behavior that has occurred. Unfortunately, it will happen. And, but when it does happen, that is also a learning opportunity for us as educators as well. We can deal with it in the moment. Sometimes that's all you can do is just deal with it in the moment and then take a few minutes afterwards to kind of analyze what has happened and make sure to always remember the ABCs, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. By looking at the ABCs, you could hopefully then build into your management a system to avoid any type of behavior like that occurring again. I can think of some examples. I have experience as an elementary school teacher. So for me, a lot of the examples have to do with maybe tantrums happening in the classroom and what triggered, triggered those tantrums. Um, a lot of the times, sharing was a very big issue. So maybe it's a matter of making sure that you put into your management system specific expectations about sharing. So then it's just reminding them about that. And another big part of managing your classroom is of course, how to set up your classroom. And uh, how do we set up a space that is no, not physical? Well, decorate it. So you can decorate the physical space that will be shown in your classroom um, if you have the means to do so. If you do not, then there are some different software that help you choose a virtual background. So even, um, so for example, there are backgrounds that you can choose and put up in Zoom that will just show up as if you're in front of it. Um, otherwise, there are some software. One of them is ManyCam. I'm going to write that down in the chat. So this is a free software that allows you to put up um, your personal decorations on virtually. There are also some props if you're teaching younger students. It's really great for that. I love to use it with my uh, online classes in the mornings. Um, and also, you can just bring some fun aspects to your class. So this is a really great opportunity for you to bring uh, more energy and more fun things into your classroom. And what we mean by that is even just wearing a t-shirt that you might have that's specific to a topic that you're teaching, um, or as well, you can dress up as if you're giving history lessons, for example, and you're giving a group lesson, you can dress up as one of your favorite historical characters. So really don't be afraid to be wacky in these times. We have to keep our students engaged. It's very difficult to keep them engaged in a virtual setting. So we have to do what we can. And, um, and that's, that's one of the, the most important things. As well, oh, um, so going off of keeping them engaged. So it's very important that your, your lesson is going to be interactive. So the more interactive and engaging it is, the less behavior issues you're going to have. 
that goes hand in hand. Um, so remember in this case, you're competing against your students' direct environment. You're competing against their constant distractions that they have when they are at home. They're not enclosed in your classroom anymore. You can't manage their engagement. So you have to make sure that they are a part of the activities that you're doing for them to be able to, uh, to learn successfully. So you can offer them variety. Uh, so change up the activities that you're doing so that it's always new and fresh for the student. And as we've mentioned a little bit before, choice is going to be of paramount importance in this case. So give them options for projects and assignments, as we said before. So if there is a final assignment, you can, uh, so for example, if I'm thinking of um, a book report, you can allow the student to choose how they're going to present their book, whether that's them uh, singing, let them showcase their talents or if they want to write a report about it, simply a paper, or if they rather want to draw about it. Um, so let them really choose how they decide to, to show you their understanding of the topic that you're teaching, and they're going to be a lot more engaged and motivated to do their work. And going off of this, it's really important that um, you ask them their opinion. So make sure this it's okay not to know what to do. This is new for everybody, and who better to ask than your students? Ask them what kind of activities they would like to see. Ask them what you can do to keep them engaged. Get your ideas from them. They're gonna know what they need more than you will know what they need. So um, make sure to, to make them a part of the choice as well. So we're all in this together and make sure that your students know that. It's really important to shorten your lessons as well if you're going to keep your students engaged. So uh, in this case, just stick to the essentials. So what exactly do they need to move forward and keep being successful? That's the question that you have to ask yourself and stick to the essentials and just give them exactly what they need. And in that, in that sense, um, your lessons will be a lot shorter. And one little tip I have is to stand up. So this is if you're giving live lessons and if you have an area where you can stand up and give your lessons, this is also going to be very important. Um, it's really important for you to bring the energy into the classroom. If the students feel your energy, they're going to have the energy as well. So standing up is something that will really help in that regard as well. It's going to be important to keep incentives going as well, just like we do in the physical classroom. We don't know what kind of distractions they might be facing at home. So making sure that we have built in systems for our classroom management that will keep them motivated will be very, very good news. And the great news about that is we don't have to change our incentives up to too much from what we have done in the physical classroom. So sometimes it might be over, if they've worked really, really well during the, a 45 minute block, they get to watch a little video that they've always wanted to see. I used to frequently have them watch um, music videos. Um, that was always really fun because it would be a little bit of a break to dance around as well. And it would really incentivize them to work really hard and we would turn it into a game where we would get have a game about choosing the video as well. Maybe it's taking a break to read a story as a group or even reading individually if that's what your class is very motivated by. Class Dojo is also a very, very good one. It's um, a system that already has point systems in place. You can upload your work. It's online already, so it's very easy. I don't know if you folks are maybe already attached to Class Dojo, but I would highly recommend it. A lot of teachers use it for their physical classroom, and it can very easily be used for your digital classroom as well. Sometimes it's even a matter of just ending class early. Sometimes they've really earned that break. Or since we're online, going for virtual games. Make sure you have a little bit of a list of, for yourself that you can say, hey, you guys have done such a great job. Let's all take you know, five, 10 minutes and we can go on, our, on one of these game websites and we can play some games. Uh, maybe it's also just you know, Kahoot. Kahoot is a huge one as well. I've always had a lot of fun doing that in the classroom and you can very easily have that online as, as well. And it's a fun way to interact with each other. Um, Scriblio is another one or Play Factile. Yeah, as Janan just wrote in the chat, if you want to take a second to write those down, they're very great platforms that can easily be integrated into your digital classroom. And remember that all of these will also change based off of your age group as well. Although I have personally found that Kahoot has been popular across the board with different ages, <laughs> which is always really great. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to keep them engaged as well. For younger groups, you can maybe take a minute to have a sing-along together if, you're ha if you have the opportunity to use Zoom and you're face-to-face -face and you can have that type of live interaction. Um, that would be definitely for the younger group and not so much for the older group. And it's really important to keep in mind to give them a break, give them a brain break. Students learning online is gonna be a huge adjustment. 
and we don't know what's, what factors are at play for them at home, how much concentration they can put in, uh, just the fact that it's a stressful time for all of us. We're all human beings right now, and we all need to break. So your students are going to need probably a few more breaks than they typically would. So make sure to keep this in mind when you're planning your lessons, especially if it's a live lesson on Zoom, to incorporate those brain breaks. Some ideas that you can do is even stretching. That'll get them up and moving, which sometimes will get some of their energy out if you find that they're being a, maybe a little too energetic, so they're having a hard time concentrating. And it also does not need to be based off of your topic of discussion. It, it can be something totally random. You can have them vote on it. Maybe they want to, the vote is, do you want to play a virtual game? Do you want to do a little bit of yoga? Do you want to read together? They also don't have to all do the same thing as well. It could be different things. It could be just, you know, here's five minutes to take a break and you can pick one of these three things to do. So uh, we have um, a message that was sent um, that I don't think all attendees can see. So I'm just going to read it out for all of you. So we were writing in the chat and asking about Math Prodigy. So one of our attendees said that Prodigy is really great, especially for fourth to sixth grade. I haven't tried it myself since I've never taught math. I'm an English teacher um, and kids really seem to enjoy it. And also for those of you who may be math teachers, we have Math Games mathgames.com that was suggested as well. That seems, uh, that seems to be really great. So uh, we're onto the Q&A section. I don't think we had any uh, questions posted in the Q&A since most of our questions were posted in the chat. Um, so please feel free to ask us any more questions that you may have. It brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, before we do let you go, though, uh, we just want to let you know what we're going to be talking about next week. So we run our webinars every, um, every Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And next week, we're going to be talking about teacher wellness and how to stay sane when we're indoors all the time. So this is going to be uh, very difficult for us to do. So you can check out our blog as well. The link is there. It's blog.paper.co. And every Monday we post um, registration links for the webinar as well if you don't know where, where to find us. We have a question about how we recommend doing assessments online. That's a fantastic question. We also went into that a little bit last week during our how to lesson plan for an online space. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. Janan, maybe when, while I answer that, you wouldn't mind just typing in our YouTube channel for people to access. So to briefly go into it, last week we discussed how we really need to change up from doing assessments in a quantitative way to a qualitative way. So instead of just doing quizzes and looking at if they know the answer, we have to look at how they can apply the answer. So a lot of that time is doing much more written work with the students, doing things like videos where you can see them applying the knowledge and then assessing based off of the video. Great, and uh, I think we got a question in the Q&A as well. Lisa, would you mind just checking out uh, what that was? Sure, so live lessons versus pre-recorded lessons. What would be some of the pros and cons? That's a great question as well. For myself, um, I really enjoy live lessons because you can have interaction like this. It will hopefully keep it a little bit more um, interactive for the students, a little bit more lively, help keep them interested. Pre-recorded lessons are also fantastic in their own way, in the sense that it can really allow them the autonomy to choose when they want to learn and how they want to do how they want to learn in that space as well. Did you have any ideas for that, Janen? Um, it was about live lessons versus, sorry, I was asking recorded. in the chat. Sure, live lessons versus pre-recorded. Yeah, so um, it's really just your students being able to interact um, in a live setting, so live versus just allowing them to, to learn on their own terms. That's really the main difference. Um, live lessons is something that I personally prefer, but once again, you can ask your students what they prefer. There are some who may prefer recorded lessons so that they can really just listen to it and get into it when they choose that when they, they decide that they are ready to do so. So um, it's really, you can ask your students to see what they prefer and um, you can also do a live lesson and record it for those who maybe weren't able to be there as well. So you're able to, to do screen recordings in a program like Zoom or a lot of other platforms allow you to do it or even on your computer, you can do that as well. So there are different ways to, to get around this. I also saw that we had a question of would we recommend involving parents for classroom management? I would personally suggest it depends on the age group you have. For a younger age group, you would 
most likely have to involve the parents to a certain degree. Chances are they're going to have to, you know, kind of take on a little bit of a role at home in terms of helping their child walk through walk through the lessons. For the older students, I would try to keep that as much between you and those students as possible. Again, sometimes things are going to happen where you're going to have to get the parents involved. If, you know, if the students are never showing up for your lesson, if they're never handing in work, the parents will have to be aware of that because that will ultimately affect their grade at the end. And you don't want to have a shocked parent at the end of the day come to you and be like, why does my, why does my child have a zero? So having that constant line of communication is gonna be really, really important. Last week, we even discussed having scheduled check-ins where depending on the age group, you check in with either the student themselves or you check in with the parent to let them know kind of what, what's happening in your digital classroom. We have another question in the Q&A. Um, have any Zoom lessons been recorded so that we can see what it might look like? Is that a possibility? We have recorded our webinars on Zoom and we have posted that. In terms of a lesson, that's maybe something that we could look into, but we would probably have to get back to you on that, unless maybe, Jan, do you know anything about that that maybe I'm not aware of? I do not. It's mainly in terms of uh, security issues. So this is this is really huge. Um, I don't, a lot of teachers won't be able to post up the recorded versions of their webinars uh, simply because uh, it's, it's a very big security issue. Um, so I, I'm not sure, but I'll look into it. I'll see if maybe there are some, some platforms or some teachers that are showing a little bit what that might look like. Uh, we don't have any of ourselves other than our webinars since we are um, we're an online tutoring platform and not an, um, an online teaching platform. Um, but we'll, we'll look into that. And if I find anything, I'll be sure to, to forward that to, uh, to all of you. We, have, we do have your emails. We have another question saying, hi, Janan, I teach at the tertiary level for three hour slots. Do you have any suggestions on how to keep them engaged? So three hours is a very long time. That's, uh, that's really hard to keep them engaged for th that, that entire time. So what I would probably do in that sense, it's, it's a really great question and it's a difficult one to answer. Um, I would suggest once again, asking them what, uh, what they need to, be, to stay engaged for that long. Um, what I would suggest, if it's possible for you to shorten your lessons, uh, you can do so, but really just, as we mentioned before, um, brain breaks are going to be very important throughout, um, making sure that you change the activities, provide them choice. So all of these tips, if you can apply those to your lessons, this will be really important um, to keeping them engaged throughout. But three hours is definitely a big challenge, for sure. I don't know if Lisa, if you have any I would just reiterate what you said and make sure you schedule as many possible breaks as you can, making sure to keep high interest activities so they're very, very motivated for those three hours as well. And this will be hard for you to keep your energy as well for the full three hours, as we know, um, when we're not walking around in our, in our uh, natural setting of the, of the classroom, it's really hard to keep the, the energy and attention up. So try your best. So once again, standing up, if you can give your lessons standing up, um, even if it's just a recording of you uh, and they don't see the video, try to give your lesson standing up and even just bringing that energy into the class will, will hopefully keep them engaged for, for the full three hours as well. Mm -hmm. I also saw a comment how some of you may be in a more rural area where it'll be harder to have a live session because the internet can be a little bit problematic. That's where I would highly recommend things like Class Jojo to keep that interaction um, still going because you can go back and have a little bit of a back and forth. It's just not necessarily going to be live as it is on Zoom. So we have another question that asks about a virtual whiteboard um, that we can recommend or one that shows video and display of content. So I'm going to bring back up ManyCam again. Um, there is a free version where you can just have one, one uh, choice of video. There are other um, paid version of, the, of ManyCam where you can get different choices of videos, but ManyCam is really my favorite to use. So it's a virtual whiteboard that you can use, you can write on it um, and have your video shown as well. If you are using Zoom, it can be integrated in Zoom as well. So as the host, you can use uh, a pen to type out and, um, and your students will be able to see it live. And we also have um, 
and yeah, there you go. So we had the answer about the three hours um, that uh, from one of our attendees who suggested to break the lecture into uh, lecture and live lessons and time blocks where they can do projects and assignments and different tasks and um, where you can just come back together for the last third of the time. So that's actually a great point as well. It's okay to not constantly be talking for the full three hours. Um, as long as you're there for the students, if they need your help, if they're doing individual work, you can do that just as you would in a, in a class where you, for example, might give them a worksheet and ask them to work on it and ask you if they have any questions. You can do that in a virtual setting as well. As long as you're there available to them, they can do their own work during that time. There's also a comment in the Q&A about how social media is um, a big competitor right now. I think, that, unfortunately, that's going to be a, a very large thing that we all face as we go into um, an e-learning setting. And that's, again, where the picking your battles is going to come into play. So if you find that your students are still engaging with you, but not necessarily in the way that you expected them to engage, i.e. using the microphone versus typing, as long as they're engaging, that's going to be the most important thing. And keeping it short and allowing brain breaks is also going to be important. And hopefully they won't go on social media, but a large thing that we also talked about last week is how we're going to have to relinquish a lot of control, not being in the same space. We're not going to have as much influence in terms of what they're looking at and when they're looking at, or if they have, you know, maybe Facebook opened up in the background as your live lesson is going on. So if they're engaging, that's great. If they're not engaging, that's where we're going to have to start to come up with different things, where your phone check-ins, where you let them know that this is going to be an issue, this is going to affect their grade will be very important. And I think there was another question posted. Oh, yes. Any tips to adjust for college level students? That's a great question. Um, I'm not familiar with college level, unfortunately. As I mentioned, I'm from elementary level. I would suggest just as much autonomy as possible. Maybe that's where pre-recorded lessons would come in much better. We don't know if they've got a part-time job going on that they need to work in order to pay rent or things like that. But at, since they're older, they'll have a lot more independence and hopefully be a lot more in, in, motivated to do their own work because they've chosen to continue their education. So you'll be able to allow a lot more independence and autonomy for them and just say, here's the assignment, here's the description, here's the rubric, take it and run. So you are almost at an advantage, advantage here that you do have an older, uh, older student population than, uh, than a lot of other teachers who are in the same position, just because they already are kind of um, autonomous in their own learning. So, but once again, like it really doesn't hurt to provide choice for your students. So we know that exams might be something that uh, may be made a bit more difficult. So you, you can provide them choice even for their final assignment or um, different exams as well. I saw as well um, a comment saying that somebody deals with adult education and they set up specific schedules for students to do online office hours. That's definitely a great suggestion going with the check-ins and making sure that there's a time where you're available so that if the students do have questions, you can, you can address them during that time and they can reach you that way. Um, so thank you for that suggestion, that's great. We have um, another comment. I missed last week's webinar about lesson planning. So sorry if this has already been discussed. Are there resources you can recommend in terms of planning lessons for our subject domain? For instance, I am a language teacher, French, and I usually rely on interactions between students to strengthen speaking skills. That's a great question. Uh, we did ha we had a list of some resources that could, that could be used. Uh, Janan, I know that you have um, a, di a different background in terms of teaching a second language. Do you want to take that one on? Yeah, so uh, in this case, it's true that interaction is a huge part of learning a language. So I would just suggest um, opening up office hours uh, once again for your students to come and speak with you. If there is a way uh, for, you can even set up group um, group hours as well where students would work in groups. Um, you can ask them if you don't want to be there, that's okay, but if you want to be able to track their interactions, then you can ask them to meet as a group for certain times and know that they're meeting at this time and um, asking them to record it and have that as a part of a graded assignment. So if they hand in the recording, that's um, that's 5%. So you might not grade the interaction in itself, but grade uh, grade the, the handing in of the assignment just so you can at least track their interaction and be able to track their progress that way. So we also, if you have, oh, sorry, just to hop in there. Um, maybe if you're working on writing and you have access to Google Docs, you can schedule times with each individual student where you're both on the same Google Doc and you're kind of watching them as they type and you're giving live feedback through that as well. It's not quite the same as face to face, but it's definitely one of the ways to still have that live interaction, especially in regards to writing. Yeah, 
since interaction for a second language, we know that's that's very important. It's uh, if not the most important aspect, and this makes it for sure definitely more more difficult. Um, we also have a question here that asks us, uh, do we have our past webinars posted anywhere? So we do. So all of our webinars are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, which is Paper Learning. Um, you can find us by looking up the, the name of the webinar as well, which is Paper List Learning. And uh, we also post after, so we record the full webinar and on Fridays we post a very quick highlight video just talking about the main points that we discussed and any important questions that may have come up during the webinar that we think is important to address as well. So we'll be posting um, and that's about five to 10 minutes um, if you don't have time to watch the entire webinar as well. Great, are there any other questions? Perfect. So we're going to uh, stop it here. Thank you all so much for, for coming to our webinar. We hope you were able to, to get something out of it that you can bring back to your lesson. If you have any more questions, feel free to um, send an email to either Lisa or myself. I will be posting my email here, janan at paper.co. Lisa's is the same thing, just with, there you go, with her name instead of mine. And I think we actually have one more question that just popped in. Oh, just thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. And it was so great to also have an opportunity to share different ideas and brainstorm with you folks. So we hope to see you next week. And thanks again for, for coming. Bye.